So the main idea of this paper and what we looked at was what happens to um, bot-infected machines after the command and control uh, infrastructure is disrupted. So uh, as you all well know, botnets have been a major issue over the past few years and uh, there has been a lot of interest in the security community about reverse engineering them and uh, stopping them in different ways and often um, the latest works are presented also in Usenix um, where there has been some really impressive um, reverse engineering and um, basically getting into some kind of botnet and eventually finding a way to uh, take over the command and control server or disrupt it etc. And this is really great because it kind of removes the botnet from the control of the um, attackers. Um, but what actually happens to those um, zombie machines? Uh, so the idea from, for this paper came from um, the data we got access to from the Conficker Working Group, uh, where they have been basically tracking the Conficker botnet from the early days, um, around 2009, and um, we uh, had we received access to this, and we thought, well, it would be really interesting to look into this question. So, um, as you can see in, on this slide and on this graph, uh, this uh, is the number of. IP addresses seen in the configure sinkhole per day from February 2009 till now. And still in 2014, um, over a million uh, IP addresses could be seen each day in the configure sinkhole, which is quite a lot. Um, assuming, like understanding that this botnet came out in um, late 2008, it spread uh, via uh, Microsoft Windows vulnerability and in later versions also via local shares and USB devices. So the botnet was pretty good in how uh, it would uh, propagate and it also used a pretty novel way to communicate with um, its uh, basically controllers. And um, the botnet grew at a really fast pace. Uh, already in the first few months, millions of machines were infected. The internet community was very worried. So um, they set up um, very quickly a working group, which in many ways was really magnificent. Um, there was a lot of uh, voluntary work between a lot of organizations. And they managed to uh, reverse engineer um, the malware and also come up with the, these, this list of domains and um, actually take over the domains um, every day. And in this way, basically the botnet was taken out of the control of the attackers. But as you can see from this graph, the number of infected machines remains relatively high. And um, this was well known to the working group themselves already um, when they released the report uh, in 2010, they uh, reported their number one failure as remediation. So what can be done? During uh, around the same uh, time from 2010 onwards, there's been another, uh, let's say, major discussion and push more of the responsibility on cleaning up machines onto internet service providers. And a number of uh, proposals by different industry groups, including the IETF, MAUG, etc., on this issue. And there have, has been also support by uh, a number of policy think tanks on this issue. And in a number of countries since early 2010, we've had these um, anti-botnet initiatives. Basically what these initiatives do is um, through some kind of centers, and here's an example, um, they monitor various internet feeds for the presence of infected machines and when they um, find an infected machine they notify the ISP, the no ISP notifies the customer, the customer is then sent to uh, a website here, you see the website for the German Antibotnet Advisory Center and um, 
basically will get help in cleaning up their machine, etc. So the question we were interested in were um, were these countries with these national anti-botnet centers doing a better job in cleaning up configured bots or not? So the question in itself is a um, relatively easy question. Um, the point was we wanted to answer it well in a uh, valid and reliable way. And uh, the idea is to use data from the configure sinkhole, which uh, logs every uh, machine infected with configure trying to connect to the these uh, domains uh, to get um, commands and it logs the IP addresses of these machines and these machines connect multiple times a day. So these logs are rather huge and by doing historical um, GOIP and ASN lookup on these logs we can actually see where these infected machines were located and if we then aggregate these two country levels and we can then compare the countries with these anti-botnet initiatives versus those without them. So that's um, the idea in a nutshell, but there are still a whole bunch of measurement um, issues to uh, deal with. One of them and the most famous one perhaps is um, the problems caused by dynamic IP addresses. But, um, internet service providers in some countries have policies where they assign a new IP address to uh, customer, um, perhaps once a day, or it might be even multiple times a day. And what that means is that the same uh, infected machine would show up um, with different um, IP addresses and we will have some kind of overcounting. These graphs show these. So on the top is a graph for the Netherlands, bottom is for Germany. And on the left side, we have the number of unique IP addresses we see in the um, configure sinkhole in that particular country uh, per day. And, and on the right, we show the same number of IP addresses, but uh, accumulated uh, per hour for the course of the week. And as you can see, although the number of uh, infected machines are more or less stable, uh, this second number really uh, can grow high. The way we decided to correct for it was to use the shortest time window possible. Uh, we use hourly. This will undercount a bit, but that is fine because we want to actually compare the numbers. So if it undercounts similarly, then it's fine. Um, other kinds of issues include uh, missing measurements due to sinkhole downtimes. Um, the way to solve that is we uh, filter about 10% of the points. Um, there, with regards to uh, the effects of a NAT on these kind of measurements, major problems are caused by carrier grade NATs and we detected these for uh, a number of countries like India and we removed them from the data set. And another issue is, well, countries have different sizes. So obviously the number of infected machines with Configure in the US is going to be much higher than the Netherlands. And that in itself is not an interesting point of comparison. Um, what is actually interesting would be a kind of an infection rate. So for this reason, um, we divide the counts by the number of subscribers in the countries. Now, this is what we have. Um, as you can see in this graph, we've basically plotted for uh, Germany, France, US, and Russia, um, the configure trends. We can see that the countries move with similar trends. There's a growth plateau and decay. There are systematic differences at the peak levels. And it's rather interesting what we see here. Uh, we actually went through uh, news, media, etc., and you can't directly pinpoint what's causing these um, downward slopes, etc. We thought of modeling this using various ways. We looked at the epidemic models, we looked at ARMA autoregressive moving average models, uh, hazard models, etc. In the end, we actually opted for a rather um, simple model that uses 
um, basically two phases. The first phase is a logistic growth, and the second phase is the exponential decay. This model captures um, the curves or transfer to different countries in a number of parameters that represent what can be observed in the data directly. And this is a question we got uh, from um, our reviewers. Why didn't you use epidemic model um, X, for instance? And the main reason is those models have assumptions on, for instance, what is the um, rate of infections per cycle or cleanups per cycle, etc. And uh, or some of the more advanced models include a number of latent variables which we cannot directly observe. So these would add um, extra complications and it would be further from our goal, which was basically to compare the uh, country. So these are the results um, for six countries, Netherlands, Germany, US, Ireland, France, and South Korea. In these plots, the blue lines are the single data, the red are the fitted values based on the model. And as you can see, uh, the numbers, for instance, are here are put. Uh, for Germany, the growth rate is 0 0.1, and the decay rate is 0 0.01 and um, the uh, adjusted R-score is 0.99. Um, and the paper uh, contains the results um, for all the 60 countries that we use in the study. On this slide, what we have is the configure growth rate for the various countries. Each uh, point is one of the 60 countries in the study, and um, these gray lines are basically um, errors with regards to the optimization um, techniques used. The red um, points or, or red crosses um, are the countries with the anti botnet centers. And the countries with the anti botnet centers, they do a bit better, um, a bunch of them, and a few of them actually, uh, Australia and um, Korea, they're doing a bit worse than the median in terms of the growth rate of Configure. Um, so basically they are all over the place. Um, and we can do the same for the other parameters. This is basically um, the at the peak what percentage of it, the machines uh, or internet subscribers were infected with Configure. And here you can see that most of the countries with the um, anti-botnet centers actually did um, better than the media. Um, with, for instance, Finland and Netherlands doing really well. But um, that does not tell anything directly about the effect of these uh, anti-botnet centers because, for instance, Norway or um, Denmark, without these centers, they also did really well. But finally, the decay rate. So basically how the cleanup went. And here again, the countries with the anti-botnet centers are all over the place and perhaps even um, strangely, a few of these countries um, did worse than the median, uh, meaning that cleanup was even slower in these countries than um, the median. So basically, we observed no evidence of countries with national anti-botnet initiatives doing a better job at uh, cleaning up Configure. Um, we thought perhaps the bots are actually located outside retail ISPs um, and that's why these initiatives didn't have an effect on them. What you see in this table is we looked at what percentage of the Configure bots were in the um, ISPs in um, these different countries. And as you can see, um, the average is above 75%. Um, so. That couldn't explain it. The other thing was perhaps, okay, Configure is a stale botnet, it has no priority, so these um, anti-botnet initiatives, they ignore Configure. 
Um, what we looked at was the overlap between um, another botnet which we had data on uh, for a specific period last year, Game Over Zeus, and Configur. And we found that if you look at the IP addresses daily, there was a 6% overlap. Uh, so 6% of the um, bots that appeared in the Game Over Zeus data also uh, had Configur which is surprisingly a high number because we also only compared it with one other botnet. And this kind of makes sense because these machines have uh, bad hygiene in some ways. So it should be a priority. So we then looked at what else can explain these peaks and uh, these differences and what percentage of the uh, computers in different countries are running Windows XP or Windows Vista because these were basically the versions of Windows that would be affected by Configure. And um, as you can see, there is actually a relationship in this uh, graph. On the um, x-axis, we have the number of bots per subscriber and on the y-axis, we have the uh, market share of Windows XP and Vista. But the relationship, so there is some kind of relationship here, but actually if you run the correlation, it's only a 0.55. So it doesn't explain everything. There is a big variance there. And we came up with a new metric, which is infections per vulnerable user. We tested this against um, two uh, factors. One of them was unlicensed software rates, so uh, or also known as piracy rate. This is a figure um, calculated by the Business Software Alliance. And um, here, uh, perhaps not surprisingly, we see, again, a strong correlation. And this kind of tells us that the important role automatic updates play in uh, keeping machines clean, because um, often people with uh, pirated versions of Windows might turn off automatic updates. Um, the other metric we checked against was the ICT development index. This is a, a figure by, uh, that's generated by the uh, ITU and it contains a number of things like uh, internet broadband speeds in countries, level of education, etc. And you can think of it as a capacity to handle, um, let's say, ICT incidents in, in some ways. And here, um, interestingly enough, countries with higher ICT development index had a lower um, Configure peak. Uh, basically meaning that these countries ha um, had um, the knowledge uh, or companies or people in these countries had more skills on how to deal with uh, infections or on how to patch their systems, etc. How does the decay rate compare with um, actually the change of uh, Windows uh, or the upgrade rate of Windows. Because if you change your machine or if you uh, upgrade your Windows uh, to Windows 7, it kind of automatically gets rid of um, Configure. And what you see on this graph is uh, each point represents one of the countries. And on the x-axis, it's the decay rate of uh, Windows XP and Vista. And on the y-axis, it's the Configure decay rate. And in all the countries behind this dot, uh, below this dotted line, the decay rate of Configure is even slower than uh, the typical rate where machines get uh, changed or upgraded. And this is sad in some ways, but it also makes sense because it tells you something about who is this group of people who still remained infected with uh, a virus, with this worm after so many years. And the same group is probably also the group that um, changes their machines uh, the least frequently. So, in summary, um, the anti-botnet initiatives had no observable impact on the growth, peak height, or decay of Configure, and on the other hand, a number of institutional factors did. Um, Actually, if you run the regression, there's, they can explain about 80% of the peak. So um, 
yeah, what does this mean? One question that came to our mind was perhaps, um, as I said again, what the, does it mean that ISPs that were part of these antibiotic initiative were not taking Conficker seriously, or perhaps these centers were not taking Conficker seriously? We presented the results uh, actually um, a few months ago to a conference with uh, members of uh, a number of um, different uh, antibiotic uh, working, including uh, two ISPs. That um, what they told us was rather interesting. They told us that they were um, actively doing something about Conficker, um, and they had been doing it, um, and this actually did show in the data because both ISPs ranked better with regards to Conficker Peak than their peers in their countries. Um, but they said that, uh, for instance, one of the challenges were sometimes they had to notify a customer many, many times before they could take action. And sometimes customers would just have repeat infections. So these are interesting challenges that have to, that basically uh, we can think of if we want to basically improve these initiatives and make them more effective in the long run. And another um, issue they pointed out was because of licensing issues with many binaries, they couldn't often point customers towards a simple tool where the customer could just click and that would clean up their machine. This brings us to um, my uh, last slide, which is um, a bit more uh, thinking about the policy implications of um, the findings we just described. So um, the infection peak can be managed. That is basically good news. Um, the correlation with ICT development tells us that botnet cleanup goes hand in hand with also capacity building. So programs that um, target um, basically developing ICT skills at the large are also helpful for um, uh, botnet cleanup in this sense and in a uh, broader picture. And the correlation with software piracy also tells us that automatic cleanups are our strongest tool. So uh, perhaps an idea would be, for instance, to give ISPs simple tools that uh, they can distribute to customers very easily that will basically re-enable automatic updates for um, this group of customers that have had their automatic updates disabled by you know, malware like Configure, etc. Um, the other, um, I think, interesting issue is when we see such long-lived bots in these kind of data sets, this indicates that um, basically ISPs should be taking action against all these bots. And in countries with these anti-botnet initiatives, this can actually be used as some kind of um, metric or for compliance, whether actually the ISPs are um, notifying customers or not, or if the notifications are, maybe they are, but the notifications are not working. So it could be a way um, also to run experiments for tweaking, etc. So uh, in that sense, it's interesting that we have these long lived bots. Um, the last um, but not least is I think that we need to also have the mindset of a marathon runner when we deal with these bot infections. So um, the next uh, botnet that's going to be sinkholed already at the start, it's good to start, uh, you know, perhaps uh, appropriating funds to be able to run these sinkholes for a relatively long run and uh, basically to have the patience to be able to deal with these in the long run and we should just accept that as the reality of how this works. Um, thank you very much for uh, your uh, attention. I'm sorry that I couldn't be here to deliver it in person and the quality was not perhaps as good as it could have been. Um, and um, now uh, I will um, hopefully take some questions. Can you use the mic? Uh, great talk. Uh, I'm Stuart Schechter from Microsoft Research. Uh, 
I couldn't quite tell from the talk uh, and uh, uh, whether these anti-botnet initiatives uh, predated or were post-configure, and is this uh, is this something that it's possible they exist because these countries have such a hard time dealing with botnets? So could there be something causal here where in the same way as we don't really have a uh, good polio eradication initiative in the US right now because we don't see polio or say malaria, that it, it's the countries that have the biggest problem getting rid of these things that are most likely to create initiatives? Thanks. Um, thank you very much uh, for the question. Um, basically, uh, yeah, it was a bit unclear from the slides, I apologize. Um, a few of these countries had these programs um, from as uh, early as 2006. So countries like Finland, Japan, Australia. Uh, I think Japan started in 2007. And um, it's an interesting question to look at actually which countries chose to start these programs. And um, it seems they're um, in some ways the countries that take um, some forms of social responsibility by uh, the, the, the private sector and public sector come together and take on uh, social responsibility in some senses. So um, there might be other countries that will be added to this in the future because there are now more countries running these centers. So um, the EU has an um, ACDC uh, initiative um, that is basically adding many more countries um, to the list of countries with centers. But the countries we checked in the uh, in this study, all of them had these centers running uh, before uh, Configur. Okay, I think we have time for about one more question, so. Hi, Grady Clark from Rutgers University. Uh, I'm wondering if you looked at how the internet service providers actually notified the infected machines, because there's tons of research on the way warnings and notifications can actually influence the way people respond to it. So I'm just a little bit curious what they felt about it. Thank you. Um. Thank you very much. Um, great question. We didn't specifically look at that for um, this study. Be here we are kind of treating them as uh, all equal in a way. It um, differs per country. Um, in countries like Japan, they actually even send by post to people when an infection is uh, noticed because they found out that people react to um, old-fashioned mail more than they would react to email. And um, in um, countries like uh, the Netherlands and Germany, the um, user's internet uh, would get cut off by some of these ISPs and the user will be sent to some kind of quarantine website. So that's also uh, this, uh, guaranteed to grab the user's attention. But uh, you're absolutely right. It differs um, per um, ISP, and it's one of the things we actually are also very interested in and have proposed as an area for future research, where they're actually looking into how you can tweak these notifications, will have a response. As uh, one of the people in these ISPs were telling me, they said they're even interested if, for instance, changing the color will make uh, users react more or less, etc. So definitely uh, that will play a role um, in uh, yeah, future research in this area. Make the speaker again. <laughs>